next session uh, is on a rather less often discussed topic that is deep pigmentation in extensive vitiligo i invite dr manish paul to deliver this lecture dr manish paul who is uh, i'm very happy to invite you he's also by ex colleague at st john's medical college hospital in bangalore he's right now the head of the department of dermatology at manipal hospital delhi and director of skin laser center new delhi he has done extensive work in vitiligo surgery and his focus is on a uh, melanos melanocyte transfer on large areas and difficult to operate areas well thank you so much uh, good afternoon everybody thanks to the organizers dr prasad for giving me this opportunity so my topic is very different from we have been discussing the whole day uh, so as we were discussing the i have been into cell transplant since 13 years and you know we devised this terms giga sessions and mega sessions we did 500 600 cm square and we did the difficult to operate areas and we have been doing it for a large of late of late i realized i am depigmenting much more i mean this is what got me thinking that you know we need to all get more sensitized that every time we see a patient of vitiligo it's, it's so wonderful to have a three day conference on vitiligo that every time we see a patient of vitiligo we should not just merely think about repigmentation we should realize when we can treat a patient and when we cannot treat we are not god we cannot treat everybody and we should understand when we should draw a line we cannot continue immunosuppressives all throughout have their own risk factors you can't put a patient on uv therapy Uh, methotrexate steroids whatever and you know at end of the day you have to understand which patient you should actually take for treatment treatment means whether you should take it for repigmentation or for depigmentation now all of us are dermatologists here and we we are the only ones who understand this word of depigmentation that we can push it a patient is going to depigment very slowly over a period of time but it's only our knowledge that we know that we can speed this process you know this is what we should do when we have a patient of extensive vitiligo so we have to learn not to say yes to repigment not every patient can be repigmented and even if you give them few months or few years of stability and repigmentation it's not really changing anything for them you know fine they're getting married you can keep them repigmented for a while but you know if you have extensive case it's pretty futile just trying to work on that that's the whole idea of my talk that we should recognize when to depigment so patients having extensive area patients having other diseases acral vitiligo so i have coined a simple term good vitiligo and bad vitiligo you know this is over simplification you know there are some patients of vitiligo who will keep prolapsing you know you put them on steroids you put them on azathioprine the moment you withdraw they are going to depigment again you know so they are those bad vitiligos those are the patients which you have to think of depigmentation how do we do it briefly touching on that so obviously we have two options the medical and the procedural counseling is the most important thing because we have to tell the patient that it is possibly going to be permanent it is a one way traffic if you depigment somebody it's unlike they're going to repigment significantly they should be explained the processes and ideally a family member should be there to make the decision i never start a depigmentation therapy for my patient on the first consultation please follow that give them time because lot of them will be shocked they don't want to listen to you but put that thought in their mind that this option is there that if we let the disease run its natural course it might take 2 years 3 years 4 years they're going to have two shades is better to have one shade and this is the whole idea currently we believe we should not treat very young patients the reason is multiple a they'll going to have lot of sun exposure and since we're taking away the melanin we're taking away photo protection from them the second thing is there is a good possibility and with all of us sitting here we might actually come up with a very good stabilizing molecule we can't take away the chance from a young child you know for a future treatment so this is theoretical we know there are multiple depigmenting agents which are available i'm going to give you some practical tips as to how you can start it in your practice but the most and the first thing is to try to identify the patient understand this patient will not recover and it is better they move to the other side 
This is the most commonly used molecule. This is the one which is FDA approved. When you start using it, do a trial area. Use on a small area. Look for the reactions. Explain to the patient. Patient will always have a priority. They will want their face to be treated first. So start with that and then you can move on to the hands and the other parts gradually. The time can take, uh, which can take is up to one year. This is an important slide, please follow it. Application of MBH at one site can lead to distant depigmentation. Patient has to be also counseled that if they are applying the cream, it cannot transfer to their near and dear ones, means they cannot sleep with the child or with the spouse. They can trigger hypo or depigmentation in the person who's coming in contact. Obviously, they have to follow sun avoidance all their life. Otherwise, the pigmentation might want to come back in the form of follicular pigmentation. Few cases, this is a patient, she had extensive vitiligo. We can see her entire body was depigmented. Only her face was still pigmented. This was the initial reaction. Now, this is important to understand and explain to the patient that you're going to get this initial reaction once you start it. This can be managed with a topical steroid and emollient and antihistaminics and eventually it will lead to complete depigmentation. Trust me, most patients of depigmentation eventually are more happy. I am depigmenting so much, I can't imagine it actually now. And another patient, again you'll see, she is almost 65 years old, so it is never too late to depigment. Don't think it is too late, why should we depigment them now? You can do depigmentation. This is the initial reaction, which is limited to the pigmented zone. It will not occur on the natural skin. Okay, and then the zone clears off. And same patient, other side, clearing off. Now there will be some patients who will not depigment just with MBH. In those patients, you can use another molecule like Imucumod, or you could use cryo or other molecules, or you could use lasers. So in my practice, I use lasers in which we can move faster, especially the exposed areas like the face can be depigmented much faster. So I use the Q-switch NDEAC in the 532 nanometer wavelength. The procedure is that you try to create the endpoint, which I'm going to show you in the next few slides. You use a big spot size like 5 mm so that the overlap is very good. Create a mild frost. This is what you need to do. So this is how the process goes on. When you're using a 532 nanometer, it is important that you're using the protective glasses. 532 and pulse dye laser are the two lasers when you cannot do it with the naked eye or with normal glasses. You have to use the specific glasses. So if you look carefully, a little frost is being created. This is your endpoint. You want to create this kind of a frost out over there. So gradually you move and cover the entire area. You make zones and cover the entire zone. So the endpoint is frosting immediately after the laser. This will form a crust. It will peel off in seven to 10 days. Another patient, you can see the frost has gone. There's a slight erythema and edema, and you can see the lightening of the treated zone and the non-treated zone. This is just after 10 days. It's not necessary that the entire thing will be depigmented in one go. You might have to come back to the same area, maybe after three to four weeks. So you have to consult the patient according to that. Here's a patient in which we had finished the face, then she wanted it over the arms, so we've been doing it in segments. So typically you can do 100 centimeters square in one go. This is the most important thing. You have to create a very mild frost without too much of PTK. Okay, and the skin will have a kind of a dusky look immediately. And over here you can see we depigmented our hand, then the forearm and gradually we are moving up. So you can do it in bunches. 532 is very painful. Okay, understand that. When you do 532 for extensive case, it's going to hurt your patient a lot. So be prepared for that and use analgesics, ice packs, and things to maintain that. This is a patient now completely depigmented over the arms. When I do the face, I typically divide the face into three zones, the forehead, the right, and the left. It's not a good idea to do the whole thing. The whole face swells up. There'll be a periorbital edema. Patient gets very uncomfortable. At least the first session, try to do just the forehead. And you can see the clearance just in one session. This is the other side. And here she's completely depigmented. Once you have finished the face, then you can take up the neck. And as I mentioned, you can do 100 centimeters square in one go. 
and then you can keep taking bunches of skin you can decide according to the patient what areas they want so the sequelae is create a frost there'll be edema there'll be crust exfoliation and skin lightening and you can achieve complete depigmentation you can combine your mbh with your lasers also but ideally you should do the laser first you should not do the mbh first before after some more again before after lightening of the lesions just with one or two sessions complete depigmentation so the message is consider depigmentation for your patient counsel the patient yeah, that your hair will not go white okay this is a very important concern for a lot of patients that will my hair also go white somehow the hair melanocytes are more resistant so they will not go white with the laser treatment or with the mbh also they have to be told that they have to avoid sun exposure forever they have to follow a complete sunscreen cloth avoid total sun exposure otherwise the pigmentation tries to come back in this follicular pattern which is again very upsetting even if it occurs you can do a small touch up or you can give the cream to apply of late we have been depigmenting relatively younger patients so far we were only depigmenting older patients but now sometimes if you have a case as i said a case of bad vitiligo somebody who is acral you know relapsing not stabilizing you know they have their whole life in front of them you know there's no point to keep waiting for the depigmentation to occur so it should be given as a option at a early age and early stage if the case is very very extensive obviously it has to be discussed in great detail with the patient you have to take consent from the patient and their family members and it is never too late the smile it tells you all you look at this patient look at her face distressed and look at her afterwards thank you so much for your attention Uh, one or two questions? Yes. Please. Uh, first, thank you for your nice presentation. Okay. Uh, I have a question about uh, the use of TCA in skin depigmentation. I think uh, there is multiple studies based on uh, the use of TCA, trichloroacetic acid, in skin depigmentation. What's your opinion about I this? I have not used TCA. No. I don't have experience with TCA. Okay. I normally use MBH. I have also combined EMQ mode. Yes. And otherwise, I switch over to the like my plan normally is to start with the Q switch and DAC for the face, MBH for the body. And if they are not responding, so what I also do is I use higher strength of MBH. So commercially in our country, it's available as a 20% strength, but I can get a 30%, 35% formulated. So that is my second step to go, is to increase the strength of my MBH. And the third step for me is to add EMQ mode. I have tried phenol as a depigmenting agent, but phenol has a limitation. It has systemic absorption. You can't really use it over extensive areas, and it hurts quite a bit. Okay. Thank you. Yes, uh, sir. Dr. Manish, uh, nice presentation, and uh, two things. One. I think as Dr. Manish said, depigmentation should be in our list of treatments and we should all really take it up because there is no point in treating a case of vitiligo with immunosuppressants for years together without getting a response. You have a case of vitiligo whom you, as he rightly said, is a bad vitiligo patient, consider depigmentation. That's one thing, the one thing that I want to convey. Second, TCA, yes. I have used TCA in my patients and it does give good results in combination with your MBH. But I think Q-switch and DAC does score over others. Uh, the rapidity of the response is too good with Q-switch and DAC. Uh, very nice presentation. I'm proud of you. Thank you, sir. Uh, the thing is you are uh, telling that uh, the hair does not uh, lose its pigment. So why don't you try to do electrolysis of the hair? remove the hair so that pigment doesn't come back from there? No, patient want the black hair. I was talking of the black hair. So patient want the On black the face, hair. the face, the ladies? They, they all want the, obviously everybody wants the black hair to persist. Their question is, will my black hair also turn white? That is the question a lot of them have. Somehow they're okay about the skin depigmenting. They're very particular about the hair going white. 
I, I think you're saying is that if the hair is still staying pigmented, it might act as a source of repigmentation. Yeah, by removing that, you're not going to get uh, develop re uh, follicular repigmentation again, and your results are likely to be more permanent. Yes, uh, but I guess if you're doing the uh, some areas, yes, but again, eyebrows and all. Uh, yes, point taken, sir. Thank you. I, I think it's the facial hair you're talking about, sir. Yeah. The rest of the hair, yeah. The yeah. facial hair. Unwanted facial hair. If unwanted it is there facial. and if it is there. No, it is two things. I don't think any lady loves facial hair. <laughs> so getting rid of it is not going to hurt her in any way. Yes, sir. So it should be considered as an option. Uh, Sarah, I, um, I would like to ask about the MEK mode, uh, using it in uh, depigmentation. So you use it alone or uh, with MBH? In combination, sir. So I'll explain. I'll repeat myself again. E yes. So I always start with... For, for me, I consult my patient for the face, let's do the laser. It's straight. Face, neck, let's, and hands, let's do the laser. But obviously the laser is going to be painful, extensive, and expensive for the entire body. So that in conjugation, you can treat, say, roughly, the literature says 75 to 80 centimeters square of MBH area. You can, you can apply a cream on that. That is like one palm. This is, so this is what a practical tip I tell my patients. You can cover your MBH on one palm of area. That is the area you are permitted to cover. So my first step would be to use 20%. If it is not responding, patient is not depigmenting, I'll go to a higher strength, 30%, 35%, or 40% also. You can get it formulated. If it does not, then I add MEQ mode. There, is, there are a lot of studies uh, MEQ mode stimulating, de causing depigmentation in patients of genital warts, condyloma. That's how the whole thing was discovered. Patients of genital warts were given uh, MEQ mode, and that's how they started developing depigmentation. So it has to be done in conjugation, because even MEQ mode is going to trigger that immune reaction which we see in warts, and so is uh, MBH. So you have to kind of space it out. So you follow a pattern like I give it alternate day, at night, for eight hours, we give it the MEQ mode, give it for at least six to eight weeks. You know, once they have failed MBH, that will be the plan. And there are lo there is a lot of literature on it, which says that they work synergistically. They potentiate each other's action. Okay. My okay. name Ahmed, Ahmed Al Isa from Saudi Arabia. It's regarding the destruction of the hair follicle. I think it's an excellent idea. In our center, we encourage people to use full body laser hair removal after depigment them because we would like to distract the reason for recurrence. So it makes more sense to distract the hair follicle as much as you can to minimize the recurrence. So this is why doing laser hair removal full body for the ladies mainly, it will be an excellent to minimize the recurrence. And we have found those who has no hair after few sessions of the laser hair removal, they have less recurrence rate even if they go to the sun. However, for vitiligo patient, we discourage people to do any laser hair removal just to keep the pigment reservoir for any future depigmentation or vitiligo in that area. Because if you do laser hair removal and you get a vitiligo, it will be difficult to repigment. So this makes a confusion for our patient. For a vitiligo patient, no laser hair removal. For depigmented patient, we encourage and we give discount for those, just to encourage them for re because it's, it is difficult and it is expensive to do full body, but we encourage them to do full body to minimize the repigmentation. And this is an excellent idea, and after we start doing it, we find less repigmentation from the patients. But uh, if I may uh, uh, say, I have never seen repigmentation in a case of depigmentation on the covered areas. Spontaneous repigmentation no, 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 is no. not very common. No, 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 no. We, have I, I, we have seen it a lot. It's, it's, okay. I know it is less, I agree with you. It, but it, it is, is not so common. Most of the times, and even the literature again says that the destruction of the melanocytes with the MBH are going to be permanent. It is irreversible. This is what we counsel the patient in the first time. Uh, but the point is well taken. I agree with you. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Munish, I had two questions. Uh, have you combined uh, retinoids, topical retinoids with MBH? Uh, I haven't, but yes, I've read about it. Most of the times I get away with my laser only, ma'am. So I think okay. I've never actually come what? across some lesion which is resistant to laser. 
So I had a small tip for my colleagues is don't start your depigmentation uh, medical program first. You want your melanocytes to be very active, your melanosomes very strong so that there's a huge chromophore out there which you can hit. So if you have already diluted it, then you're not able to do it. It's, it's something like, you know, if you remember, we used to use efflorithene for hair removal. So we used to say it turns the thick hair into fine. So our take eventually has been start with hair removal, let the hair not go fine, because if it's going to go fine, you're not going to have enough target to shoot it. So don't start the creams initially, start the lasering first. And you know, it's also recommended that you tell the patient to get a tan. Yeah. So if they pick up a tan and then you do your Q switch in India at 532 nanometer is going to work far better. You have a better chromophore sitting out there. What about cryo? Have you tried cryo? Again, it gets very painful, yeah. blistering. And as I again say, uh, I've been doing a lot of depigmentation since six years now. Most of the patients would work with this protocol. But yes, there would be some patients you could do with the cotton tip. I agree. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, can we take the questions later? Sorry. Thank you.